When it comes to our faith, we have to admit very, very quickly and very often that uh, we cannot necessarily get our heads around the supernatural realities that await us, or heaven, or God, or grace. So Jesus himself often speaks about these things in what we call analogy. So you compare it to something we do understand, and then say, it's like that, but better or more. Like, what's heaven like? It's like a mustard seed. Well, it's not really like, I mean, <laughs> heaven isn't like a mustard seed, but that there's some aspect of the mustard seed or some aspect of, of, of yeast, right, that, 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 has, that we have in common with heaven. Or there's some kind of similarity. Uh, so we often have to speak uh, using analogy uh, when we speak about God, when we speak about divine things, because they go beyond us. So words aren't really going to be sufficient, okay? So you'll forgive this, this analogy that I'm going to make, but uh, uh, I heard years ago that hell, when one goes to hell, there's like this great banquet, right? A great banquet in hell. Absolute succulent foods and fine wines and the whole lot. And uh, everyone is uh, given... Uh, a knife and a spoon, right? And they're taped to their hands, this knife and a spoon, right? You think, what's the problem? Knife and your spoon are six foot long, right? So you go, and no matter what you do, you, <laughs> no matter what you do, you, you have all this food in front of you and you can't eat it, right? It's all there, but you just, you can't eat it, right? And in heaven, similarly, there's this magnificent ban banquet, and everyone gets, did I say a knife and a spoon? Fork and a spoon, probably better, a little more refined. Okay, a fork and a spoon, okay? And everyone feeds everybody else. And that's how it works. So in heaven, it's, 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 it's not so much, um, yeah, it's that every, everyone thinks of everyone else. Everyone thinks of everyone else. They put the other's needs before their own. Whereas in hell, everyone is focused, my world, my self-realization, my career, my looks, my popularity, my money, me. So hell is the kingdom of, of me, and heaven is the kingdom of God. How did uh, And so similarly, there's, there's, there's this idea here. Uh, in, 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 remember, just keep in mind, this is Jesus telling this story. So this isn't, we're speaking about Abraham, but this isn't from you know, the Old Testament. This is Jesus speaking. So keep in mind, Jesus is saying, this, this is very important when we get to the end of the gospel, uh, which we'll look at in a sec. So Jesus tells this, this story to the Pharisees. There was a rich man who used to dress in fine, in purple and fine linen and feast magnificent every day. Um, purple, back in the day, was exceptionally expensive. Not only was it very expensive, it was so expensive it was out of the reach of 99.9% .9 of the people. Only royalty could afford it. Why? Because purple came from mollusks, right? So fish, clams kind of things, right? And it took 9,000 of them to get one gram of purple. So I don't know, it came from their, little, their, their tears or something. I don't know. Like it's something ridiculously small. You just squeeze them. But to, like 9,000 of them to get one gram of purple. So I don't know how much you'd need to dye this. But I don't know, 20 grams? 20 by 9? 18,000. Hang on. 18, 180,000 uh, mollusks, mollusks to do this. You know what I mean? So it's like ridic just ridiculously expensive. Um, so... So uh, Jesus uses this deliberately, right? This guy is stinking rich, right? Okay, he's really, he's exceptionally, he used to dress in purple and fine linen and feast magnificently every day. So this guy is living in the lap of luxury, okay? He's proper loaded, okay? Uh, on the other hand, then, we've got uh, the other complete extreme, okay? You've got Lazarus, who's not just poor, right, but covered in sores, Right, so it's just really just destitute, like. Uh, he longed to fill himself, not, not with food, he doesn't even want, like, the stuff from the table, just any, even the scraps, the chicken bones that fall off the table, I'll gnaw on them, just anything at all, right? So it's just, again, these two extremes, absolute extremes. And then, as, as if that wasn't clear enough, dogs even came and licked his sores. I mean, that's how, you know, and you didn't have the energy to kind of shoo them away. They just lick his, you know, awful, 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 just absolute poverty. Okay, so the poor man dies and the rich man dies. Uh, the poor man 
has a name. Lazarus, the rich man, doesn't. We don't know. We don't know. Again, this isn't. Didn't, this isn't. This didn't actually happen. It's Jesus telling a, a parable. But the rich man is just the rich man, whereas the poor man actually has an identity, has a has, has a name. Okay, Lazarus. So Lazarus suffered during his life, and obviously must have been a good man because there he is uh, in, in in the bosom of Abraham. Now, interestingly, most of the conversation from here on has to do with the, the rich man. So the rich man is separated from Abraham, but can still see him, okay? So there's, there's, there's a couple of interesting things here. Uh, in his torment in Hades, he looks up and sees Abraham a long way off with Lazarus, and he cries out, Father Abraham, pity me, and send Lazarus just to, to dip the tip of his finger in water and cool my tongue, for I'm in agony in these flames. It's kind of like the, the reverse now. You know, just, just, I, I'll take even like just a drop of water, anything at all, just like during their lives, Lazarus would have taken just the scraps that fell off the table. I'll take anything, a drop, just, just dip his finger and dip it into my tongue. I'm just, I'm in agony in these flames, okay? And Abraham replies, my son, you had good things during your life. Bad things came the way of Lazarus. Now he's being comforted, you're in agony. But that's not all, that there's a, a gap between us. You can't come here, we can't go there, okay? Now, Lazarus says something very interesting here. Sorry, the rich man says something very interesting here. Uh, Father, I beg you then to send Lazarus to my father's house. I have five brothers. Warn them that they don't come here. Now, this is what makes me think that the rich man isn't actually in hell. I think he's in purgatory. He's in a place of purification. Why? Because he actually thinks about other people here. He actually thinks about his, his brothers. I don't want them to come here. And he can also see Abraham and, and Lazarus. So they're not so separated that it's, just, it, it's a different reality altogether. Hell is like a definitive separation from God. It's, as I said, the kingdom of me, where I only think about my needs, and I'm back down there will be what we, hopefully. Uh, but those who are in hell, like, they, they do not love God. They do not love. It's a kingdom where, where hate reigns supreme, where me reigns supreme, not, not a kingdom of, of concern for others and love for others. So my estimation would be that he's not actually in hell. He's in, pur he's in purgatory. He's in purgatory. He's in a place of purification. Because Earlier we heard that he was rich. We heard that he dined magnificently. We don't actually hear he did anything wrong. You know, it doesn't say he was cruel and heartless and beat his servants. It doesn't, it doesn't say that. So, but it appears that he wasn't ready for heaven anyway. So it could well be he's in, he's in purgatory because he actually does care about his brothers. I remember, again, this is going back to what I said earlier, it's Jesus telling this. This is important now for the last bit. I know, Father Abraham, if someone comes to them from the dead, they will repent. Then Abraham said to him, so Jesus replies, if they will not listen to Moses or the prophets, they will not be convinced even if someone should rise from the dead. Jesus just said, I'm going to be betrayed, scourged, hated, mocked, and crucified. On the third day I will rise again. And yet I know that some people will not be convinced, even if I rise. I just find that astounding. It's just, it's an incredible thing for the Lord to say. Uh, I will go through all of this passion. And for some, of, for some people, it will not be enough. I will, I will absolutely empty myself. And for some people, that will not be enough. It's, I just, it... You know, I think, again, uh, we, we've kind of made our, our, our faith at times so child-friendly is okay, childish isn't. At times that we forget like the, the, these, these adult realities here that Jesus is going to go through an absolutely horrific torture. And at any moment he can say, I'm God, it's over. He can do what he wants. He can walk on water. He can pass through crowds and disappear. Of course he can disappear. He can do what he wants. He's God. So at any moment, like, he could have just, you know, carrying the cross and the cross would drop and where'd he go? He could have. Absolutely. But he sticks it out the whole way, step after step, blow after blow. Expression of hatred after expression of hatred. The whole way unto death. And still knows that it won't be enough for some. My goodness, like, could just imagine. I mean, there are, you know, there are parents I've been in contact with who who 
whose families have fallen apart. Maybe there's a son or a daughter uh, who moved away and for whatever reason fell out with, the, with their parents. Uh, differences of opinion or you, you, you'll know of, of similar situations to, to do with wills and those kind of things where families can get split just for stupid money and one half not talking to the other and so on and so forth. And just how, how, how this can be such a, a profound pain for, for the parents who, who love their son, love their daughter, but the daughter just has no interest in them. And over something small, you know, over something ridiculous. And they continue to love, they continue to, to, to try and win the back, they continue to, to, to leave that door open, but nothing from the other side. Do you know, it's, it's a profound pain when you do everything you can to love and it's responded to with indifference or hatred. It's just not enough, I don't care. And this is what the Lord went through, you know. So it's, it's, while it's a, it's, a, it's a sad thought, we can kind of turn it into a, a good thought in that this is how much we're loved. This is what the Lord will go through for you. So while not everyone will accept, some will. Some will. And this is the power of our love. This is the power of your love today. This is the power of your prayer wherever you are today. When we pray, we can console the heart of Jesus. Also in the name of those who don't. When I pray, when I sacrifice myself, when I uh, offer up my day to the Lord, I can console him in the name of those who don't. And there are many who don't. Sometimes I don't. So we have this uh, amazing reality on one hand, the, the, the deep sadness of the Lord, that his passion won't be enough for some. And conversely, that, that, that our love can actually console him. It's, it's an amazing privilege placed in our hands. So we ask the good Lord today, in our prayer and in, in, in our work today, in whatever services you're doing, whatever meals you're preparing and houses you're cleaning and garages you're cleaning out and whatever we're doing, that we offer it up out of love to the Lord. And that we tell him in our own way, Lord, I'm just so incredibly grateful for your sacrifice on the cross. I'm sorry if it ever wasn't enough for me, but I want to tell you now that, that, that I'm immensely grateful and I will tell you this for all eternity God willing if I get to heaven so may the good Lord renew our faith today and in this season of Lent Amen